Well, friends, this day has arrived. And here in the back house, I have with me Rabbi Sharon Browse. Welcome to the back house. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. <laughs> you caught this. Is this your first podcast? No. Oh, okay. So this is all you've done this before. No, but I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say it's old hat. You know, it's still, <laughs> it's still uh, fresh and interesting for me. Okay. There's so many things that uh, I have heard from you that I would love for my peoples, my Robcast people, to hear. So let's start where it started. Where did you grow up, by the way? I grew up in New Jersey. You grew up in New Jersey? Yes. I remember you telling me you're, you were in New York City. Yes. For college. Mm -hmm. And what began, how did it all begin? Were you like, I'm missing something? What's the deal with my tradition? Right. Who, who am I? What am I doing here? <laughs> like, how did it begin? Okay, so here's, so here's the Jewish story. Um, I once called this my Jewish autobiography in six short chapters. So um, I actually, I grew up with a very strong sense of Jewish identity, but not a, not a very strong context for what Jewish community was and what Jewish life really looked like. And so it was important to me to go to a college where there was a Jewish population there so I could find my people. And yeah. um, But when I got to college in New York, I realized that my people were not my people. So I kept walking into what's, Jewish what's environments. I'll, I'll explain. Okay. Every Jewish environment I walked into, I felt like an outsider. And it's one thing to walk into when you're in college and you're exploring, to, you know, to, to walk into other religious communities um, and kind of like an anthropologist to see what you can learn. But when you walk into your own space and you feel like you're not at home in your own space because you don't know the basic rules of conduct, because everybody else seems to know when to stand up and when to sit down and what the right words are and what the right rules are, and nobody ever told you. So then suddenly it's a very deep sense of alienation um, from self, which is which is a pretty tricky thing to yeah. encounter, especially in those early years of college. And I had a number of humiliating experiences in the early days. So I always I always used to think about the cartoon where you have a guy like sawing a circle around his chair and, you know, underneath and then falling through the floor. And I just wished I could fall through the floor because I would always speak up when I was supposed to be quiet or engage when you're supposed to disengage or say exactly the wrong thing. And I just didn't know. I didn't know enough um, about my own people's traditions and history to know how a Jew is supposed to comport oneself in public Jewish space. <laughs> comport which many years oneself. later turns out to be a, to my advantage, I think. But so did you grow up going to synagogue? I did, but it was a... Um, it was a different kind of, first of all, we went rarely yeah. and we kind of made up our own rules. So um, we called ourselves Haredi reform. So Haredi is what is the term that many people use for the ultra Orthodox. Um, it's a kind of, it, it makes so, no sense to have those two words together. Wait, oh, that's ultra Orthodox, but reform. Right. So the reason I say <laughs> Haredi is because we had such a stringent, rigid practice of reform Judaism. So we made up all kinds of rules. Like in my family, we ate bacon all the time, but we would never eat ham, like God forbid. No and it way. made Did no <laughs> sense to anybody except to our family. Those were the, like, those were religious practices. But when you so, were in high school, you're like, mom and dad, this is weird. No, I didn't know it was weird. You, how do you know it's weird until you leave? So you just <laughs> thought it was normal. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, and then, and then I got to college and realized <laughs> that my Judaism was a very weird Judaism. And so for a while, I really, I have to say, I fled from the Jewish community because I found... In Jewish communal spaces, I only a deeper sense of alienation. And um, and you know, when you walk into a synagogue and you're searching for home and for comfort, and it only reminds you of how much you don't belong there, it's very painful for people. And so I left for a while. Then there was one. There was a turning point moment for me in my second year of college, where and I and I had spent so I spent a good amount of time exploring other religious traditions. I was studying Eastern religions um, and practices. I was studying African. American history and culture. I wanted to be a civil rights attorney, really dove into the academics and into the city, into the, the cultural and intellectual life of New York City, which was such a gift. And then there was a terrorist attack on the Israeli embassy in Buenos Aires and my, my second year of college. And I was a universalist and a human rights activist and a civil rights activist and not a particularist in any way at this point. And I was completely devastated by this attack. And I did not know why. And I was even embarrassed that I felt so 
torn up over it. And I remember that a couple of days earlier, there was a, there was a terrible mining accident in Turkey and lots of people died. And I was really sad when it happened, but it didn't feel like it was my family. And when this thing happened to the Israeli embassy, it felt like it was my family, which confused me <laughs> because I really felt so disconnected from the Jewish people. So why did it touch me so deeply and so personally? And so I realized I had to explore that. I had to try to figure out what's going on. Um, and it, it basically sent me off on a journey of exploration where I realized that I couldn't just be a cultural Jew living on the Upper West Side of New York, reading The New Yorker, drinking coffee. You know, I actually, I actually had- It an, meant something. I had an inheritance. It was mine, right? And, yeah. and I realized I needed to know what my grandparents had rejected when they decided that the most important thing was to become American. And there's this whole mythology around Jewish immigrants to this country that as they approached Ellis Island, they would throw their tefillin, the, the phylacteries off the boat. And that, you know, that, that deep sea divers could find thousands and thousands of sets of phylacteries, these prayer um, objects, ritual objects right around Ellis Island, because the idea was that, um, was that Jews coming to this country came here seeking religious freedom. They did not want to stand out. They didn't want to be different. Their main priorities were Americanization and suburbanization. They wanted to be just like everybody else. And I felt as a result, a couple of generations later, I was left without a sense of who I really was. Mm -hmm. And it, I was so hungry to learn. And so, and I, and I didn't know where to start. I mean, how do you, how do you learn your own story? And so there was a cute boy who lived across the hall from me, <laughs> um, redhead. And so, I, you know, and I knew he was kind of a super Jew in high school. And so I asked so, him, he wait, was like, soup, what, what's, you know, what's a he super was a, Jew? He was a guy who knew stuff and also <laughs> wasn't so judgmental that he wouldn't talk to me. So I asked him, would he help me find a synagogue where I could feel at home and feel comfortable? Um, he asked his mom and she sent us a list um, of every single synagogue in New York City. And so the two of us started to go out every Friday night for a year. And we would go to every synagogue in the city and I would leave everyone crying because nobody welcomed us. Nobody introduced themselves. Nobody ever said what page they were on. It's all in Hebrew. I don't speak Hebrew. I barely read Hebrew. How am I supposed to learn if I can't be in a learning environment? And, and I felt so much shame about not even knowing my own story and my own people, my own culture. I mean, how do you, how do you learn yourself? And you know, this is, so this is our falling in love montage because we would go and I would cry and then we'd go out to dinner and drink wine. And you know, <laughs> so then we fell in love. Eventually we got married. Um, and now we have three kids and it's a happily ever after. But at the time it was very trying and, and it was a kind of personal turmoil for me. Was he on the same quest? Well, he grew up with a very strong Jewish identity also, and his family grew in practice. And so they had a, the most gorgeous practice of Shabbat that actually I went home to his family in Philadelphia one, uh, one Shabbat when we were this year during our search. And their practice of Shabbat dinner, just I, I, in, I knew in a moment, this is what I want in my life. Friday night. Friday night. I lit the candles. Candles. Welcomed in. Spirits. Four kids in this family. The rule was you can not go out on Friday night, but you can invite anyone in. So the table is full of gorgeous food and gorgeous people and the, all the kids and the parents pulling books off the shelves, sharing things that they just read, singing songs, share, reading poetry, teaching pieces of Talmud, pieces, pieces of our Jewish tradition to each other up until one or two in but the morning. Like natural. And it's gorgeous. And free flowing and funny yes. and yes. unexpected and smart. And it's just yeah. this... Yes. And it was, you can't go out, but you can, anybody can come anybody in. Anybody can come in. So their house became kind of a hub of this beautiful, egalitarian, progressive, soulful Jewish life. And I thought, the that's, first time you that's saw it, what it must I have blown want. your mind. It totally blew my mind. Um, and I, I, you know, and then, and then we kept searching. We went back to New York. We kept searching for a place. I still needed to learn. We land on a place just by coincidence because it was the next one on the list. Um, it was his this, mom's list. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so my mother-in-law's list. Um, this is how she won me over, really. Um, and this place is on the Upper West Side in New York. It's called B'nai Jeshur, and I'd never heard of it. We walked in. I literally, it was held in a church because, um, because one morning the, the roof of the synagogue collapsed. Thank God. I mean, if services had started, there would have been 600 people killed. I mean, it's a total miracle. It happened two hours before the services began Saturday oh, morning. 
This Whoa. was years before I was there. And the church down the street, the pastor came out and said, come, you have to come pray in our church until your synagogue's repaired. So we walk into church, basically. <laughs> and I turned to David before we went in and I said, you know, we've been searching for a long time. If this place doesn't work, I'm giving up. Like, I, I don't know how hard you can search to find yourself. I'm going to follow other paths. <laughs> And I remember saying it to him, we walked in, we sat in the back row and the rabbi started to preach and I'd never heard of him or the, sh this, this synagogue or anything. And he started to preach about HIV AIDS. And he said what I will, ne I will never forget his words, but he said, he said, hatred and fear will prevent us from responding responsibly to what will become a pandemic. And he said, mark my words. If we don't do something right now to fight against homophobia and to demand funding to, st to, to stop AIDS and to help victims of AIDS, he said, tens of millions of young people will die around the world. And I just, I was totally paralyzed, like could not believe that somebody in the early 90s was talking about something that actually mattered in a holy place. What, what is religious life, what does religious life have to do with what's happening out in the world? I was completely stunned. And then he started to sing and the place just erupted and everyone got to their feet and they started to dance around this church. And I, and I said to David, we're home, we're home. Like, this is what Judaism is. It's just that all those other institutions have gotten it wrong. Like they forgot what it's yeah. all about. And I said, we're going to Israel because I have to learn enough Hebrew and I have to learn enough of our practices that I can be this kind of Jew. And so we set off, like, really, we signed up, you know, we went to Israel for junior year abroad and, and my heart was and open. And he went too. He came they... too. So you asked, <laughs> was it his journey or mine? I mean, I, I pulled him into this journey. I mean, yeah. he, he grew up with all of these things as basically assumptions, but I think on our journey and through teaching me, he learned to love it himself also. Yeah. And also as a grown up, which is different from when right, you grow right. up with it. Um, and so we went to Israel together and had, it was a, an absolutely transformative year, um, really learning about learning about Israel, learning about the history of this place, beginning to struggle and wrestle with contemporary Israel, um, really learning how to love my people, how to see my people for all of their complexities, um, and and how to and how to love them and how to find my voice among them. I started to study Talmud that year, which was a mind blowing experience for me. Talmud. Uh, everybody is like, uh, how would you describe it? A commentary on Hebrew scriptures. You're you doing great. You have Mishnah <laughs> and Gemara, the yeah. two parts of Talmud. Some yes. of its stories, some of its very complicated legal discussions. So and so says in the name of so and so about such and such point. Um, so when she says, Tal and by the way, Talmud is awesome. Everybody, <laughs> I'd recommend Every Man's Talmud, which is a compendium of yeah. interesting things. It's sort of like dipping your toe in the shallow end of the pool, and it's fantastic. Anyway, right. So the, so the Mishnah is the first Jewish code of law, and it was codified around 220 CE. And the Talmud is the next 600 years of conversation about the Mishnah. And so it's really this vital conversation happening over the course of many centuries where it where people are engaging people who died 300 years yes. ago as if, and so these voices are alive and these characters are alive and they're struggling and wrestling. And one of the characteristic elements of Talmud and why I loved it so much was that dissenting voices are always honored in the Talmud. So even yes. when it's one against the many and the <laughs> many win, so even still the, the voice of the individual is preserved and, and because it might be that a thousand years later, that person turns out to be right. And so we protect and preserve the dissenting voice. And there, the Talmud was, and I think that the, in, both the development of the Talmud and the practice, this rigorous engagement with text, with written text is actually what kept, has kept the Jewish people alive for thousands of years. And uh, I mean, it is, it is, this has been an incredible survival mechanism for us. Yeah. And I think there are thousands of years of tears and love that have been poured into this book. And the same way that these rabbis were engaging people who lived 400 years earlier, they're also engaging people who live 1400 years later. And we're all kind of in dialogue with each other. Yeah. And for me as a young woman and as a feminist, you know, it was like what I really was searching for is where's my voice in this text? There are, there are no women's voices recorded in the Talmud. There are three women who are named in the entirety of the Talmud. But women are not there. Women are not in allowed in the space in the Beit Midrash, the house of learning where the men are battling it out generation after generation. 
And, and what I felt was, so, so not only is it a, a source of kind of personal sadness that my voice is not represented there, but our tradition, there's a void in our tradition mm -hmm. when all of our voices are not represented on the yeah. page. And so I started to feel some kind of sacred obligation to add my voice and to raise questions that I don't think the men had raised over the course of all these years and to shed tears that men didn't shed over these ideas and these texts. And it felt like a holy act of recovery. It was like a, t we call it a tikkun. It was an act of healing in a way to bring, to start to bring more voices into this very traditional conversation. I didn't want to start a new conversation. I wanted to learn my uh, and have my own, this conversation that my people had been having for thousands of years, but that was incomplete without me and without the voices of many others who also weren't seen in those days. And so take the wisdom of the past, but also but also add to it the wisdom of the, you know, con art of, in, of the contemporary space where we understand what invisibility means and what it means to bring in those who've been excluded and actively make space for them. So I'm in Israel and my mind is being blown, you know, every, every Shabbat, all week long, I'm studying, I'm learning, I'm having this very traditional Jewish existence. Um, and, you know, and I end up having an epiphany one weekend in which I realized that, um, I realized that all the people I admired most in the world, my great personal heroes, and you know, and I never got excited about movie stars and rock stars. I got excited about human rights heroes, like people who really were agents of social change in the world, were the, were the people who I, you know, even as a child, like those are the people I wanted to read about and, um, and had conversations with in my head at night when, when the terrible things would happen in the world. I realized that so many of them had faith it just had never occurred to me, but that there yeah. was a, that was the consistent thread yeah. that they believed in something bigger than themselves and that, that they saw their work as part of a greater context. For many of them, it was the context of the exodus from Egypt. And it's not by accident that Martin Luther King spoke so beautifully and so eloquently about the journey of African Americans from slavery to freedom as the journey of the Israelites from Egypt to the promised land. And that trope has been used where, as Michael Walter writes, the political theorist, wherever there is suffering and wherever there is the Bible, people have looked to this narrative as a source Absolutely. of inspiration and comfort. And so I realized that this is also my story. This is the central core narrative of my people. And I've never thought of it before, but I think I believe in God. And I believe that I'm part of a broader trajectory of human history. I'm a part of it and I can be passive or I can be active in it and I'm gonna be active. And I, in a flash, I mean, it happened in an instant. I remember exactly where I was sitting. Where were you sitting? <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. I was sitting at, in an Orthodox outreach program because when you're in Israel, there, there are Orthodox yeshivot, houses of learning. They look for kids like me. They look for people who are young Americans, sort of lost, not knowing what their Judaism means to them, not really knowing who they are. They come to Israel for a year and they plucked me up and said, hey, we've got a program for you. And they brought me into the old city of Jerusalem for this weekend of learning. And it was an incredible, it's so, it's so powerful to be there, to watch the sun set over the West, you know, watch the sun set, the sun rise. So it was the last day of this weekend. They did this slide presentation where they shut off all the lights and they're trying to prove on Sunday the existence of God through all these ca mathematical calculations. And if you calculate the number 72 and then you circle every 72nd number, you can prove that God exists because here Treblinka <laughs> crosses with Himmler and with Eichmann. And so therefore God exists. And I realized in the dark. It was like Jewish apologetics. Jew, it well. Pro like a, that's fascinating. It's like an attempt to prove what cannot be scientifically proven. Yeah, right, right. In an effort to bring people to faith. Yes. So I realized as I'm sitting there that I don't believe a word that these people are selling me. I don't believe it. Like, I don't believe in the code thing. I don't think that God predicted Eichmann and Himmler and Triple. I don't believe it. If I believed in that kind of God, right. it would cause me greater right. problems, right? Right, right? But I realized that I do actually believe in God. And I, I, again, I burst into tears. The lights go on. These five ultra-Orthodox men come over to me because they see that I've been touched. And one of them says, so what do you think? What do you think? And I said, I'm going to be a rabbi. 
Right? I'm going to be a rabbi, which like, it never occurred to me before. I mean, I did not have that a model. That just blurted out. I just blurted out. And I had no, there was no rabbi in my life who was my mentor, someone I respected, someone who I aspired to live life like. I just felt it from the core of me. I thought like King, Gandhi, Mother Teresa. I started to think about all of these exceptional people in the world and realize, oh my God, faith. Faith is what glues all of my commitments. And I have this realization, I say it, and then, and these poor guys were not trained to handle someone like me. And, and so they just turned pale. And one of them says, you know, you should become a rabbitson, which is the word for a rabbi's wife. <laughs> and so, and I said, uh. well, I don't want to marry a rabbi. I want to be a rabbi. I want to teach people Torah. I want to hold people when they're crying. I want to help people find hope and faith. And I want to believe that the world can be different than it is. So I realized we're having totally different conversations. So it was a journey. I mean, at this point, I barely knew anything still. I was really still, in, I mean, essentially like a second grader in terms of Jewish knowledge. You're 20, 21, probably. Mm-hmm. And I went back home. I mean, I'm still, I still had another uh, year of college. And I basically signed up for like, the Aleph Bet classes, like beginner Judaism classes. How can I start to, I mean, I'm studying, I've both studied Talmud, but only in English, you know, at this point. And I have all these big ideas, but I don't even know the fundamentals. So then I got to learn the fundamentals as a grown up, which was a gift and a blessing in the end. Mm-hmm. Um, I have, there. I, there's an, one moment I remember so clearly where I had an, um, an Orthodox Chavruta study partner and we would learn together. We were learning the book of Genesis. And we get to the story about Isaac meeting Rebecca. And if you, know, if you remember in the story, um, there's, a, there's a, the moment where Isaac sees Rebecca for the first time. And it seems she, you know, she falls off her camel. And so she tells me, well, you know, Rashi says that Rebecca is only three years old when this happens. And I said, well, I don't know who Rashi is, but that's clearly wrong because she's, she has agency. She's a grown woman at this point. She gave consent to go and marry Isaac. So she, so she says, no, Rashi says that she's three. And I said, Rashi's wrong. And then we both start to cry. And so, I, and so, she, said, she, so she said to me, I said, why are you crying? She said, it never occurred to me that Rashi could be wrong. She said, why are you crying? I said, because I don't know who the hell Rashi is. <laughs> like, I mean, clearly this person is so important. Because Jew- Rashi's like a legend. Rashi's Rashi commentary com- for many people is like exactly. one click down from the original exactly. words. And, we and re- you were like, I don't care who this dude is. Not that I don't care. I, like, he, whatever but he's saying that happens to not he's, work. He's wrong. He's one voice. I have another voice, you know. <laughs> so I realized I had a lot of learning to do. And eventually went to rabbinical school. I, I you know, I ended up... After many years in rabbinical school, actually, had an, another, I had a theological crisis my fourth year. Um, I remember on the, on the front page of the New York Times, um, before I go up to seminary that day, I'm reading a story about these horrible floods that ravaged Mozambique. And they were talking about, there was an image of a woman on top of a tree holding a bundle in her arms. And the story was about how women all across the countryside had climbed trees because there's raging flood water below that had just ravaged the country. And they're waiting there until some rescue helicopter is going to come and get them. But the problem is there are no rescue helicopters in Mozambique because the country had just gotten over a civil war of 19 years. There's no money. Nobody's coming to save these people. And many of them were holding babies. I later learned that one woman gave birth up in a tree during, while waiting for rescue. And I, and I had this moment where I realized like, this is happening right now. When you have access to news from around the world in the instant, you have a different set of obligations. Like we have to go get a rescue helicopter and save these women. So I was so, so all tied up over this. And I went to seminary after like a few hours of sitting on my couch saying, oh my God, we have to help. How can we help? So I went up to class and I remember sitting there and we're in this class on medieval Jewish literature. And my professor is tapping out the beat of medieval Arab poetry so that we can learn from Arab poetry about Jewish poetry, it's like golden age. And I look around and I realize like, what the hell are we doing? People are dying right now. Like literally they're in trees. They need us. What is the point of all of this Torah? 
if we're not doing anything to help these women. And so I, wa I storm out, it's very dramatic. I storm out of class. I remembered when I was in college as an undergrad at Columbia, they had a center for the study of human rights. I just, I'm like carried there by some force unknown to me. I go upstairs to this office and I walked in and I said, I need to see your director. It's an international emergency. <laughs> and he says, this lovely guy, whose name is Paul Martin, who is like really one of the most beautiful souls. And it turns out he was a former priest. And he said to me, come in, come in. I said, listen, there are these women in Mozambique. They're in the trees. I'm dropping out of rabbinical school. We have to get rescue helicopters. And he said, come in, sit down. He said, I have to tell you something. You're not dropping out of rabbinical school because as a ra he said, you will do a lot more for the world as a rabbi who gives a damn about the women and babies in Mozambique than you will as someone who's going to go try to raise money for rescue helicopters oh. today. And he made me stay in school. And I started studying human rights and conflict resolution at Columbia for my last couple of years at, um, in rabbinical school with him and with some extraordinary folks there. And ultimately realized you have to forcefully integrate these worlds that if the religious life is gonna mean anything. It has to respond to the contemporary reality that we're living in. There has to respond to poverty yeah. and grief and terror and war. If it doesn't, it means nothing. So I loved sitting in the Beit Midrash and studying for 14 hours a day, but it means nothing if I can't translate that into, into building a community of activists, the people of shared commitment, a, a, you know, a group of people committed to the work of justice and helping to realize human dignity in the world. And so you graduate from rabbi school. Yes. And then where do you go? Do you stay in New York City? So I went back and did a fellowship at this very same synagogue where I had had my initial B'nai Jasherin on the What's Upper West Jasherin? Side. What's Jasherin? What's B'nai? It's still there. It's the it's the um, the children. B'nai is the children of. You see that in a lot of yeah. the um, in a lot of the names of synagogues in the country. And Yeshurun is one of the names that Israel's called in oh, okay. um, in traditional literature. And so I, I end up working there as a, I did a rabbinic fellowship there, and then I came out to LA. And when I came out here, I realized that so many Jews that I was meeting here were creative and smart and interesting young Jews, and none of them were connected to synagogue life. Why? Because they felt the same thing I felt when many years before I went from synagogue to synagogue in New York and couldn't find a place that felt like home. And I, I, you know, I just started having coffee with people and talking to them. And asking them, what is the problem with religion today? And I, you know, and I learned a lot. <laughs> like what I realized is that these people are not rejecting any of the core tenets of Jewish or religious practice. They're actually not rejecting ritual. They love ritual. They're not rejecting community. They desperately seek out community. Yeah. They're not rejecting the, the ideas of gratitude and humility. And, and mindfulness. They're not rich. They, they love the idea of discipline around eating, which we might call kashrut or Jewish dietary laws. They resonate to all of those things. What they reject is the, is a 20th century iteration of religious institutional life that feels dead to them. And yes. they don't like the container. They love the essence when they're introduced to it. But right now the only delivery mechanism for the essence is these very old containers that don't work anymore for a whole new generation of people who aren't going to bang their heads against the wall. They have an allergy to institutional religion. They want the good stuff, but they don't want to, they don't want to have to pay at the door in order to get in. They want to have to go through four security checkpoints in order to get in. And so what I realized what we have to do is create mechanisms for sharing and communicating the very heart of religious life with people who are hungry for it, but don't have to walk through the same doors. It's not the container that's holy. It's the essence, the fire inside that's holy. Yeah. And so how do we do that? And that's how we started to build our community car because we really felt like the world is freaking on fire right now. I mean, there's, there's death, there's, there's poverty, there's yeah. inequality, there's racial inequality, there's mass incarceration, there's, there's brutality all around us. And, and people are fleeing from religion because they see religion on one hand, either as part of the problem, as religious life becomes more intolerant, more exclusive, more hateful, and more violent, mm -hmm. or complete, more Trumpy. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> or more impotent, right? Because you walk yeah. into like most in religious institutions and it feels like they're driven by fear, 
they're incredibly boring and under and interesting. They're afraid to like put a stake in the ground to say what needs to be said. And they're really like dependent, they're dependent on kitsch and, you know, kind of sh very shallow attempts to get people in the door, but aren't touching the soul and aren't being driven by the heart of the matter. So you're in your late twenties at this point. Yes. And you just, do you have a moment of, I'm going to start? Yes. Uh, a synagogue, community, temple, what do you call it? You know what? We didn't. We decided not to call it a synagogue, only be, not because it's not, but only because nobody in their right mind had a positive association with the word synagogue at yeah. this point, right? So, like, everybody <laughs> grew had a synagogue they grew up in and said they never went back to after their bar mitzvah. So I wasn't interested in replicating bar mitzvah, the sort of Jewish rite of passage right. at age 13. Right, right. And so, you know, what Were I— Were you bought mitzvahs? Mm-hmm. You were at 13? Yes. Yes. Okay, so everybody said that word, don't do that word. <laughs> no, everybody not said... everybody said. My instinct was, we're going to avoid the word. Okay. Because I feel like what we need to do is create something that's not constrained by the by the negative interpretations and understandings that yeah. people have from bad experiences of their childhood. By the way, some people have some positive experiences from sure. Jewish community. But by and large, there was a whole generation, my generation and the one after it too, that really felt alienated from synagogue life. And I thought, if I'm trying to, cr like, I want to expand people's thinking about community, we're just not going to use the word. So we didn't call it a synagogue. But what we did was we started with a vision, a vision statement where I basically said, at a time where religion has become, on one hand, more violent, extremist, insular, in all of these things, and on the other hand, ap apathetic, indifferent, and totally disconnected from the most challenging issues of the day, we are putting a stake in the ground and we're going to try to reclaim the prophetic voice. We want to reclaim prophetic grief, prophetic activism. We want Shabbos to mean something to people. We want to reclaim the Sabbath, right? We want people to learn how to engage their own inheritance, our Jewish inheritance, in a way that's meaningful for them today. And people really responded. I mean, we were so, we were to totally stunned and amazed, but they wanted this. They, they really wanted to be able to take part in their own religious lives. What they were rejecting was the passivity of yeah. the religious institutional space where there are all these rules of engagement. You walk in, if you follow the rules, you know, you can get out and get a cookie at the kiddish afterwards. <laughs> what they, what they wanted was to feel get something. Get a cookie at the kiddish. Yeah. <laughs> like people want to cry and yes. they want to, and yep. they want to dance and they want to feel. And when something happens, like God forbid, you know, like what happened in Orlando, last week. I mean, they want to be together and they want to grieve together and they want to talk about what it means to be a human being in yes, the world today. Yes, a space to what give are we expression gonna do about to whatever it? you're in at this moment. And they want to figure out together, how do you translate grief into moral action? What does it mean as a community of Jews and Americans alive in the world today to respond to the most challenging moral conundrum of the moment and to do it together? And so we started to build this thing and like this, it just sort of took off and people really responded to it. And now, I mean, now it's been 12 years, um, you know, and we have a growing community. We're still on this growth trajectory, thankfully, you know, here in LA, but we also have seen the birth over the last decade of a number of other emergent communities around the country where that are sort of driven by the same attempt to give people back their own religious lives and say there is a way to be Jewish in this in the world today that can really resonate in the deepest way there is this vast tradition has a place for you in it so around the country people started seeing what you were doing and it's called ikar 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 which is yes. the hebrew word for the essence or the root or the heart of the matter. Ah, oh, that is the best name. <laughs> Thank you. You know what we that did? That is the best name. <laughs> I can't even as somebody who takes great joy in a good name or a title or a subtitle. That is... Thank you. Oh, so I here's how even... we did it. David and I sat down as we realized this thing was going to happen, and we wrote down everything we wanted, what we wanted to capture in this new communal experiment. And then we translated every one of these words, and they all translated as ikar. Every one of them translated oh, no as ikar. I mean, it was kind of incredible, like essence, root, foundation, core, heart. So we realized that's how, that's what it has to be. And it also, that kind of, it broke the mold a little bit because the traditional way of naming synagogues was B'nai something, B'nai something, or Temple Beth something. And we realized 
okay, what if we don't follow that rule and we just call it something that means something to us today? So we were trying to figure out how do you not take anything for granted and really ask fun fundamental questions about the tradition in how we do everything. How do we pray? How do we dress? I mean, there were all these rules about what you had to wear to synagogue. And, you know, I grew up and that was the single most important question in, the, in your preparation for High Holy Days. It was not, where is your heart? What kind of tshuva or turning of the heart do you need to do? It was, what shoes are you wearing, right? Like, what, <laughs> what, you, what pocketbook are you going to get that matches your shoes? So, like, what if we create a space where people come in what they're comfortable in? And some people are going to wear a jacket and some people are going to wear jeans. And that's not what it's about here. It's yeah. about how, what happens when our voices come together in harmony, some out of the fullness of love and some out of the depths of grief. And together we lift each other. What does that look like? So you start this, you're 28? 29. 29. It starts to grow. It yeah. starts to grow. People start seeing it. And then it's people start doing similar things around the country. Are there people within traditional Judaism who are have a problem with this? So a few things. Um, I don't want you to credit me with the <laughs> as you have with birthing <laughs> this whole emergent movement. I think there were. Do there, they call it an emergent movement? We do now, and that comes from the Christians, um, <laughs> as you know. Um, I, well, first, let me take we a step back here. We got that from the Christians. Yeah, we did. We did. <laughs> um, when we when we started, I was a part of this group of um, innovative synagogue leaders. So great rabbis from really good synagogues around the country. And I realized at Ikar, we were asking really different questions oh, than word, they were asking. Oh, my word. Because they're, like they're yeah. in big old institutions and right. they're and they're the best institutions in the country and they're doing great work and they're trying to figure out how do you make movement in an institutional space. And I'm and I'm thinking, do we need a membership model? Like what do we need? I mean, what if it's not how much what by what percentage do we increase our dues? But maybe we don't do dues. Maybe we do things totally differently. And so I realize I'm asking a different set of questions. I can't believe how so, similar this is to my story. I can't even believe it. <laughs> I can't believe it. So it is, I mean, I'm sure on some level we were responding to a similar, this is a zeitgeisty thing. Yes, because, yes, yes. So we, so, so a, a friend of mine says, you know, there are these Christians who a few years ago <laughs> started to do stuff similar to what you're doing here at Icar, And I think you should meet some of them. And so he actually brought in a bunch of pastors and we sat together and they introduced to me the whole idea of like, emergent Christianity. And it just blew my mind because it was not happening yet in Judaism. And I realized so much of what we were doing on instinct was actually, I mean, already the Christians were t a decade ahead of us. I mean, this was, and you're part of that movement. I mean, this, this is a, like, I was sort of learning about what was in the works already, thinking differently about community and about membership and yeah. about, you know, about caring for each other as a community in a different way. And so, so some, some of this, so in New York, a few years after we started, so a community started in New York and then someone, a, a great rabbi from San Francisco came down and she actually was at an e-car service and she said, oh my God, I want to do something like this in San Francisco. And she went back and started, then we started bringing students in who would stay for many years at e-car and then go out and they started to build in different cities. So there's one now in Chicago. Um, a really one, one of my, my colleague and student and, and now teacher and colleague who built an extraordinary community there. And we realized at a certain point a few years ago that in this, there was a kind of Jewish emergent space that was emerging for lack of a better word. And we were all, we all shared a similar DNA. They're all different. You know, mm -hmm. we have different approaches, different, slightly different, you know, but, but we have a similar DNA and, and, it, and we're attracting similar kinds of communities. So, um, so we got together and we realized that what my friend Rachel's doing with Kavana in Seattle and Noah's doing with the kitchen in San Francisco and Lizzie in Chicago with Mishkan and David with Romimu and Amichai with Labshul and, and Shira and Scott with Six and I. I mean, Wait, these are Labshul? Labshul, it's called. Oh my word. You love Lab that, don't you? Shul. Oh yeah, it's a good one. The kitchen? The kitchen. Lab Shul. Lab Shul. Some of those names. They're great, right? They're so great. So we realize in the way the funding world works, like we were all competing with each other for, you know, for small grants from found, from the few foundations that fund innovation. And oh. so mm -hmm. we thought, what if we join forces and we do something great together? Like, what if we really try to raise the field? And we, we called ourselves the Jewish Emergent Network. And 
we just got a big grant to start a national fellowship, rabbinic fellowship, where seven new rabbis are coming into our seven organizations. So one new rabbi for each organization for two year period. And then there'll be another rabbi for another two year period, which a really visionary foundation called the Jim Joseph Foundation was the lead funder on. And we're training these new rabbis in what this emergent space could look and feel like. And they're, they're, so I have a rabbi here in Ikar who just started this week, who's a new rabbi. And he's going to be with us for two years, but he's also traveling every six weeks to one of the other communities. So he's going to get to, to, to learn their different ways. And the way that Judaism works in Seattle and San Francisco is very different from how it works in New York and L.A., and, and then um, go off and hopefully, you know, either revitalize, help revitalize or reimagine a pre-existing institution or build something new. Um, but to bring a new spirit of creativity, of, of moral courage, of imagination into whatever Jewish space he, they end up going into. And we're doing it now I in a collaborative it. way. Like, really, we're partner. We're all partners in I this now. I love it. So you... Um, you have sermons, you have people getting married, you have people who want marriage counseling, you have yes. a, a growing network of leaders. What is what is the part of your work that, that you most love, where you're like, this is the part? Mm. That's such a good question. Like, what is the thing that, fi like, the other things you do and they're meaningful, but they're all, but there's... What is the part that you personally are like, this is, this is the thing? You know, I had a coach years ago who, uh, an executive coach, who said to me, at some point, every clergy member needs to decide if she is a pastor or if she is a prophet. Oh, my word. And she said, you can't, you can't be both. Like, you can't be both a game changer and at the bedside. It's impossible. And raise three little kids, you know, <laughs> like all yeah. that at once. And it, it tortured me. I mean, I really, I, I, I really struggled with this. Uh, and I thought, I really love people. And the fact that I think there needs to be great social change and the fact that yeah. I think we need a kind of prophetic leadership among our clergy today is not going to come at the expense of being with real people when they're hurting and when they're celebrating. And yet, uh, you know, so how did, there has to be a way to hold all of this. And when she said that, did you have pushback? Did something within you say, no, oh, I yes. can? Yeah, immediately. Like, I, I said, like, uh, no, understand. I thought we have to, well, I have to figure out a way to do it. I yeah. have to figure out a way because I'm not, I can't, I cannot choose. And I can't choose between the kind of external and the internal work. I think the only reason I have the legitimacy of any kind of external voice is because I have a presence at home with my people and because mm -hmm. I have a community that can cry together and dance together. And if we didn't, if we didn't and we couldn't, so then I would, what right do I have to talk about what, you know, social change or what Jewish communal change could look like. And so what I love is we have an extraordinary team at home, um, including my executive director and co-founder and dearest friend, Melissa Balaban, who's, you know, what really the person in whose home Icar was born 12 years ago. Um, I have an I have an incredible um, associate rabbi who works with me who's a real partner. Um, we have an amazing team here, and when I what I really love is when we're when we're approaching a holiday and we sit together and we brainstorm and we say, well, what if it doesn't need to be done that way at all? What if we just completely rethink the model and we and we deepen our own practice by thinking of more creative, more inclusive, more beautiful and expressive ways of engaging our tradition. I love that. And I also love being a part of a growing multi-faith justice movement. And I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a senior fellow at Auburn Theological Seminary, and they've, they've identified, they've worked really hard to build a multi-faith justice movement and to put us in conversation with each other. Like mm -hmm. the people who really care about advancing a conversation about racial and economic equality, who really care about, whose hearts break about the tragedies that occur on the on a daily basis that don't have to occur because of lack of political will to change them and to realize that we are all in the same conversation whether we're sitting in church or mosque or synagogue or non-synagogue Jewish communal space <laughs> on you know on our holy days that we are that we have to be brothers and sisters in this work together and i i really feel what one of the things that that fuels me right now is the recognition that all justice work today has to be interfaith justice work. Like we have to work together yes. to get guns off the street. Thank we you. have to work together for racial justice. We have to work together for economic justice. And, and so when I'm in like multi-faith spaces, I feel so, I feel so, 
full and yeah. so yeah. I'm so deeply inspired. And I think it's making me a better rabbi. So when I hear your story and when I hear your teaching and your, your courageous stance that you've taken on so many of these, it makes me feel like I should be braver and I should be stronger <laughs> and more courageous. And so I feel like we need to inspire yeah. each other in that Absolutely. way. Absolutely. Absolutely. What are you most excited about for the next decade? Oh, wow. <laughs> um, first, getting through this election cycle. <laughs> oh, thank and you. And putting all of this behind us, yes. hopefully, God yes. willing. Um, and then really working to rebuild civility in this country and de basic decency toward yes. one another. And we're really learning how to listen to each other and how to build a society that's rooted in love mm -hmm. because we've moved so far away from it. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, I think, I, I suspect you and I see this similarly, but I feel that there, there's so much fear right now and there's so much vulnerability and everyone feels like a victim, everyone, whether the Jewish community feels victimized, the, the, the Muslim community feels victimized, the Christian community, the, whether you're black or white or brown or none of the above, if you're LGBT or if you're cisgendered, if you're hetero, everyone feels vulnerable and everyone feels like the victim and it's just not a productive way to build to build collaborative partnership it's not a it's not a, the it's not the right kind of seeds to plant for really beautiful imaginative community building and society yeah. building yeah. and so i w i want for us to move beyond fear and beyond a sense of victimization and really work together to build the uh, an aspirational america an aspirational country where where we see these incredible people of all different faiths and backgrounds working together to uphold one another's dignity. And I mean, lately I've been talking about and thinking a lot about what it means to stand in embodied solidarity with each other. What does it mean for us to actually cast our lot with each other in our own moments of vulnerability and in each other's moments of vulnerability? And I think that it, the same kind of vulnerability and fear that could lead us to anger and violence and hatred and, and these horrible, venal, terribly destructive policies that are being proposed could also lead us to a deeper acts of love. And I think that's a kind of spiritual and cultural shift that, yes. I, that I believe we have the power to engage in the coming decade. Yes, yes. Um, and you, you believe that we could actually pass gun legislation and actually make progress. Oh, I do, I do. We have to. We have to. We have to do this. And I, I mean, I, I, I don't know if you heard the end of Chris Murphy's filibuster yesterday, last night. No. He ended late in the night and he shared this excruciating story about this young boy, Dylan, who was one of the kids in Newtown, um, who was gunned down. And he tells the story that, that Dylan was, um, was on the autism spectrum and he had a teacher, a special needs teacher at school with him in school that day at Sandy Hook. And he was in love with this teacher. She was like one of those extraordinary people who just connects so deeply with kids. And, and, and Chris Brown said that was when, when he, was, he was in the, um, I think the fire station where they brought all the parents when they were awaiting news. And he went there um, as a representative and he was with the parents and he said he was with Dylan's mother when she learned that her son wasn't gonna be coming home. Mm. And one of the first thoughts she had was, I have to find this teacher and ask her, what did he say in his last moments? What was he doing? And then she realized that the teacher wasn't going to be coming home either because this teacher would never have left her child to die alone. And, Chris, and, and so Chris Murphy said that in actuality, what happened is this teacher ran toward Dylan as the gunman came into the room and wrapped her body around him and covered him with her body and they died together that way. And so the last emotion that this child felt was not terror, but love. And he said, it does not take an act of courage to stand up here and filibuster for 14 hours. It takes an act of courage to run toward gunfire and wrap your body around a child so that he doesn't die with hate in his heart, but dies with love. And the question is like, what are we going to do about it as mm -hmm. a country? And this, I mean, this has got to change. Right. It right. has to change. And the only thing we lack is the political will to do so. I think we all know that. And, and somehow we've given over our national politics to the very people who are profiting off of the sale of guns in this country. A and we're afraid, to, we're afraid to talk about it. And politicians are afraid to do anything about it. Something has got to change. I mean, a little bit will hopefully change now. 
uh, and it seems like there's going to be a little bit of movement on some back on, on closing some loopholes. Yeah. But it's not enough. There has to be a real there has to be a massive culture shift on the way that we talk about and think about and legislate on guns. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Could not agree more. And it feels like the I mean, everybody says after each shooting, oh, now it's going to change this one. For some reason, Orlando, something for me when I saw L.A. Times worst mass shooting was like, OK. There's some tipping point in here somewhere. There's got to be a tipping point at yeah. some point. And yeah. I think most of us can't believe it wasn't Sandy Hook. And, yeah. and I, yeah. I mean, I'm sure, like, leave it to the historians to try to figure out what the hell went wrong there. But the fact is, at some point, this country will wake up. And so many Americans are so pissed off about guns and have seen that nothing has changed. In fact, it's, it gets worse after each mass shooting. At some point, it's going to change. The question is just how many more parents have to bury their children before that yeah. happens. Yeah. If this is a moment of awakening for us, so so you know, let it let it be that. Let their yes. lives not be in vain. Yes, well said. I am so glad you came to the back house today. Thank you for having me. You are me so here. crazy inspiring to me. <laughs> I feel the same way about you as it and turns out. <laughs> your story there's just so many moments where I'm like, I know what that feels like. I know what that feels mm. like. I know what that feels like. Um it's just so great. Thank it's you. It's just so great. I can I just say to that point, I really feel <laughs> I really feel like this is this is a, a contemporary American religious institutional struggle, not just a Jewish institutional. I mean, I think the yes. the challenges that we have in the synagogue yeah. space and in the Jewish community, I hear from my friends in Christian spaces and Muslim spaces, they're dealing with the exact same issues and I think we can address them and resolve them together. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, is there anything that people can get connected with your interfaith justice? Mo How would people get, learn more about that? Great question. I mean, I would, t I would send people to Auburn Theological Seminary. Auburn Theological um, Seminary, interfaith justice. Multi-faith justice work. Multi I mean, people, and I would, l you know, people can come check out our, our stuff online, which is, yes, it's ikar, I-K-A-R dash L-A dot org. I -K -A -R. A R dash L A dash L A dot org. And so whenever we write or find inspiration in things that are written, we're, we're posting and putting things up. And, and you write, you write op-eds, you write, you do a lot of writing. People can get all of that at ICAR site. Yeah. Or we'll always post it there. Yes. And on Facebook, I have a Rabbi Sharon Browse page if people want to. B R O U S Rabbi Sharon Browse. Yes. Oh, uh. you are just, <laughs> uh, as I would say, a sister from a different mister. <laughs> Ah, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. All right. Grace and peace, everyone.